Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Huge thanks out to Harry's for sponsoring tonight's show. They're gearing up for Father's Day with an awesome limited edition Father's Day shave set. I'll tell you more about that here in just a second. But if you want to check them out, it's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Five bucks off your first purchase if you use the promo code Thinking Atheist. Coming up next week, it's God Awful Movies. I'm teaming up with the God Awful Movies podcast crew to review several religious films. Going to take the following week off as I'll be traveling. Going to be speaking in Mobile, Alabama, June the 18th. Santa Rosa Beach, Florida on Monday night, June the 20th. Details on both of those stops at thethinkingatheist.com slash events. On the 28th of June, I'm going to release the audio and video of a presentation that I gave last month in Canada. The speech is called The God of Cancer, and I'm fully expecting some serious backlash on this one because it's a pretty unpopular subject, and it deals with the God that allows cancer and the prayers that we offer up to God for the curing of cancer, the merit and power of those prayers, the promise of prayer given to us by God, the declaration of divine miracles, in the face of physical human intervention, the blaming of ourselves for being so nasty and dirty and sinful and causing all of this cancer in the first place, right? It's our own sin nature, that kind of thing. It's a compelling presentation and I think a necessary conversation that's coming up on the 28th of June of this month. Again, it's called The God of Cancer. Today's show is the reading of a short story that was created just for this broadcast, just for our listeners, by Ed Swominen. I've had Ed on the radio before. He was with us last summer and his short story, Abraham's Excellent Adventure. He is an engineer. He's an inventor. He's a former fundamentalist Christian, and he's an author. He's written the book, An Examination of the Pearl and Evolving Out of Eden, which he co-wrote with Dr. Robert M. Price. He does a lot of writing on his blog, Ed Swominen's Shitty Little Blog. And I'll include all those links in the description box of this broadcast. But he's written this piece called The Stones of Tribulation. It is torn from the pages of Scripture. Well, actually, it's a fictional work that uses the Old Testament as its foundation. And for those who are defenders of the Bible, I would really love for them to spend the rest of this broadcast with us because they might find it quite surprising and more than a little bit alarming. Certainly compelling and entertaining stuff. I'm going to talk to Ed as we set the story up here in just a second, and then I will read for you The Stones of Tribulation. But first, a quick thank you out to today's show sponsor. Father's Day is almost here. June the 19th is Father's Day, and Harry's.com has a fantastic gift for Dad. It's the special limited edition Father's Day shave set. This thing comes in a classy, giftable box that you can have engraved if you want. It has a personalized card if you want. Inside the box is a matte black razor handle, a chrome razor stand, Harry's Moisturizing Foaming Shave Gel, three of Harry's handcrafted blade cartridges, and a travel cover. $40 covers the entire Father's Day set. I like Harry's style. I like the quality of the shave. I like Harry's for gifts because these shave sets look and feel really good, and they're something that your giftee will actually enjoy and use. My listeners can get $5 off their first purchase at harrys.com with the promo code THINKINGATHEIST. Economy shipping through June the 9th, a terrific gift for Dad, and plenty of other customizable shave sets for you and yours. So check them out right now at harrys, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com, with $5 off your first purchase with the promo code THINKINGATHEIST.
And I'd like to welcome the author of the story that you're about to hear and talk for just a second about the Stones of Tribulation. Ed Swominen, thanks so much for joining me on the radio. How you doing, man? Great to be back. Well, so we collaborated last year with some good response. One thing I love about the way you write is the Old Testament as written has a lot of horrific stuff in it, but the way it's written, it's hard for many readers to take it personally. Have you seen that? It's kind of a shallow skipping off of these really nasty things. Yeah, the the numbers and the atrocities just fly by, if they even get covered at all in Sunday school or church. And if they do get covered, you just kind of hear them and, yeah, okay, David, Goliath, you hear the happy stories. But even the awful stuff, um, Noah, you've talked about Noah quite a bit. You know, all these people dying, genocide worldwide, uh, yawn, it's it's no big deal. The the righteous few are saved. So-and-so smote so-and-so. And you go, oh, that's terrible. Pass the salt. Right? For yeah. some reason, it just doesn't register. Even right. the verses that invoke infanticide and whatnot, you hear that, you realize it's awful, but it's on some level doesn't really click with especially many believers who have been raised to equivocate and sort of apologize for or excuse a lot of this stuff. Even the uh, one example is the Amalekite slaughter. I remember hearing about that in Sunday school, and it was all the focus was on Saul's disobedience in saving just a few of the of the best of the flock. You know, it was his problem that was the the issue we were supposed to focus on. The idea of slaughtering all these people and everything that was just ignored. I was reading an article in Christian Today. I don't know what the context was, but you know, people send me articles all the time, and it was someone excusing the atrocities of the scriptures by saying it was a different time. You hear a lot of this, Ed. It was a different time. They needed different rules, and and they needed a stronger hand back then. I hear that, but I also hear the claim out of the other side of their mouths saying, oh, this is God's holy word, his unchanging, unperishing word. It's never going to change. And that's usually when they're talking about gay marriage or something like that. So they skip all the verses that say you cannot wear a shirt with cotton polyester blends, or you can't eat lobster, or you can't get tattoos. Those they ignore. Yeah, pass me one of them bacon burgers, you know. (laughs) A cherry-picked Old Testament. So with Abraham's Excellent Adventure, which is in our archive, and I would encourage people to go back and listen to it. In fact, I'll include the link to that show in the description box in case you want to go back. You had taken the Abraham Isaac story, a beautiful story of one man's amazing obedience. So obedient, in fact, he was willing to sacrifice his earthly son for the greater eternal good kind of thing. And then you put it together in a completely different scenario that drives home the horror of it all. Right. If that thing actually happened today, we would not be looking at the guy named Abraham quite the same way. So here we spin back into what book are we going to be into for the Stones of Tribulation story? What book of the Old Testament are we drawing from? Well, it's the one I think is one of the worst, which is Deuteronomy. And uh, that one is just full of, uh, it's just a big dark cloud uh, that's um, you know, it's, there's a ton of bad stuff in there. So I picked out one of the, quote, inspiring, close quote, stories of, of Deuteronomy. And you place this story, interestingly, again, kind of in the present day, which, again, seems to help bring it forward and put it front and center in front of the listener. It makes it easier to relate to. Was that a purposeful thing for you as a writer? Yeah, and it's actually a little bit in the future, a little bit of a post-apocalyptic story um, where I think things possibly could go if if things all go wrong. And it was a little bit inspired by the recent uh, candidacy of Ted Cruz, who was this dominionist, and his father was a dominionist. They really wanted to see God's Word, the Bible, uh, established as the law of the land. And, and uh, I could just imagine the what would society be like if they really got their way? There really are people that have wanted this. Uh, Reconstructionism is a, a branch of Christianity that's been advocating for this. And there are people right now being homeschooled, homeschooling their kids into this kind of a, a view of things. Um, and it's quite, if they ever got their way, which thankfully it doesn't seem like they're going to anytime soon, it would be a quite a nasty world to live in. Pretty horrific to see Ted Cruz and his wife sort of announcing before he dropped out that he was God's candidate. 
You know, it was God's yeah. will for him to run for the presidency of the United States. And then when he has to drop out, it seems no one in the faith, there are very few people in the faith, certainly in the media, are pointing a finger at the guy and saying, hey, wait a minute, I thought you were God's will. It just seems like a huge plot hole that no one's talking about. Well, it's it's along the lines of how God is only only gets credit for the good stuff, and we seem to forget when um, we sh- he should get the blame for some really bad stuff. And it's also true of the prophecies in the Old Testament, where they, they prophesied things that flat out did not occur. We're not even talking about vague stuff like the Messiah, but we're talking about, you know, uh, this particular city will be laid waste and nobody will ever occupy it anymore. Well, you can go there, you can fly there and visit and see lots and lots of people there, but God is sort of forgotten about when the prophecies don't come true. So that's just a piece of, of that same thing. Well, I'm going to read the story called Stones of Tribulation. There is a lot more information than what I can cover here audibly in the sort of the narrated version. You have a tremendous amount of extra stuff in a written version of this. Is that right? Yeah, there's a lot of footnotes, um, 23 footnotes to this story. As with Abraham's Excellent Adventure, there's also footnotes to that, because I wanted to really show, you know, the reader, here, look this up. You can actually see where this stuff is supported in the Bible. You could see a plausible version of this happening. If people really did follow what they consider God's you know, holy unchanging word. And guess what? They don't, and it's a good thing they don't. Well, I appreciate you writing the piece, my friend. I'm looking forward to sharing it with our audience, and thanks for helping me set it up here on the radio. It was a pleasure. Let me encourage you before I begin reading the story, if you're not at a point where you can really focus, I would encourage you to hold off on listening to the rest of the show until you can get to a place where you can sort of mentally take the journey with us and give this story the chance to build the atmosphere that it deserves. Having said that, I hope you enjoy The Stones of Tribulation. But if this charge is true, that the girl was not found a virgin, then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house, and the man of her city shall stone her to death, because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The Christian Bible, Deuteronomy 22, verse 20. The stones in that pile were way too small. Jacob had searched frantically for big knockout rocks down at the riverbed, but the shale broke off all wrong from the cliff and nothing loose or near the water was any bigger than a fist. He was being spared from having to throw any stones, because it was his sister. You go fetch some instead, Levi had told him. But he still had to witness along with everybody else, watching the jagged fruits of his morning's labor pass into the hands of his father, his cousins, and the only friends he'd ever had. Levi raised a chunk of shale in the air and held it high and menacing as he walked over to the cabin and stepped onto the porch. The planks were stained dark and blotchy when Jacob and Leah first followed their folks onto that porch ten years ago. Later, when they asked about it, they got read a Bible verse about utterly destroying the men and the women and the little ones. That was all anyone ever said of it from then on. Now Levi Harding was standing there on that porch, newly anointed prophet of the Deuteronomic Church of Holy Reconstruction, ready to render the latest verdict from God's holy law. Jacob took a quick look over at Leah, tied to a hickory snag about twenty feet from the cabin. She slouched against the dead trunk, head tilted back, eyes open slack to the hazy hot sky. Levi's prick of a brother went over and shoved her head down, because you weren't supposed to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and be drawn away to worship them, still a concern, it seemed, even if you were about to die. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, Levi yelled. 
leaning out from the edge of the porch with a flat shale in his hand, like he had one of the law tablets right there, fresh from Sinai. Almighty God brought us to this river and gave us this land of hills and valleys to the restored glory of His holy name. Amen, shouted the men hefting their stones. Amen, shouted the women behind them. Standing off to one side, not nearly as far away as he wished he were, Jacob moved his lips with the Amen, but made no sound. When he commanded our fathers to leave Harrison for the hill country, the Lord said, Fear not, neither be discouraged. He fought for us as we took possession of this land and the spoils of it. Levi wrapped the knuckles of his free hand on the gray wood of a post holding up the metal porch roof, a mighty king with his conquest. Jacob joined in with the Amen this time, seeing Levi swing his gaze over to him, checking. He was going to be watched closely for a while after this. The Bible included no provisions for shooting deserters, but Levi had found it a good practice to adopt just the same. The guns were never very far away from any of Levi's main guys, and they still had plenty of rounds left. And those boys could track. Levi paused his litany for a moment, holding the air quiet and heavy. Well, so much for the good news, thought Jacob. Here comes the bad. But he didn't just give us these blessings in the days of tribulation, did he? Levi said, voice rising now punctuating the words with urgency. Murmurs and no sir from the men. He also said, Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. A pause. Then he went on plowing through the hard old text Jacob had heard hundreds of times. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Levi turned to his brother. Caleb Harding, did you find this woman to be a virgin when you bedded her upon your marriage night before last? No, sir, I did not, Caleb said, stepping away from Leah and handing Levi a brownish wad of cloth. It was a bedsheet, Jacob knew, plenty the worse for wear since being found folded and crisp in the fancy place up on the ridge behind them. Once the destruction of the enemy got done with, God chose the ridge house for the Hardings to occupy. The absentee owner, probably once a higher-up at some Walmart supplier over in Bentonville, no doubt disagreed with the decision. But by that point, the cops and National Guard had their hands full in the cities, and the only law out here was guns and Deuteronomy. Levi balanced his chunk of shale on the porch railing and shook open the sheet with both hands. He held it up in front of everybody, making a show of scrutinizing every sweat-stained square inch for evidence of hymen rupture. We stand at the door of her father's house, he said finally. He wadded up the bedsheet half-turned toward the cabin door behind him and tossed the sheet onto the threshold. Then he picked his rock back up and jabbed it in Leah's direction. Now the scripture commands us to carry out the judgment of a jealous and righteous God. The men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. The crowd of men shifted around slightly as legs sought better footing, and throwing arms raised and tensed. Jacob looked at the rocks in the men's hands and wished yet again he could have found bigger ones to get this over with faster for Leah. The screaming could go on awfully long sometimes, without a knockout to the head. And there was something else he felt, besides regret about the puny rocks. 
It was creeping upwards from his gut and landing in his face with a hot flush that sat there silently, accusing him. He was ashamed. And not the usual Bible shame for failing to love God or breaking one of His commandments in thoughts, if not deed. It was for going along with what He was seeing right there in front of Him. He had fetched the rocks. That was his big sister tied up there, waiting for the rocks to hit her in the face, because Levi in his Bible said so. It just didn't figure. And here Jacob was, only just now coming to terms with that. He hadn't read much other than the Bible. Books were hard to come by. They were supposed to burn any worldly literature they found in some heathen's living room after getting their killing done. Same for electronic stuff, which didn't work anyhow without power. The last time he saw anything from what still made it onto the Internet was the day before they headed out of Harrison. The words of Scripture, especially Deuteronomy, of course, oozed across his mind, with little else there as competition. The Hardings, father, and now the son after him, boomed out those words day after day, making you sick of the hearing of it. But nothing else seemed worth considering. A few stray ideas from the old world had gotten through to Jacob back when he was little, though, past the homeschooling wall. He knew people didn't act this way before the tribulation. Maybe they didn't act this way now, past these hills. Levi did a big overhand throw of his arm, leaning back and all, and hurled his rock, missing Leah entirely. She lifted her head back up, spitting out angry words that Jacob barely remembered from the old world. You fuckers, she shouted at the men, her voice shrieking angry and clear above the thud, thud, whack of the rocks that started landing hard on her head and chest. Fuck you, fuck you all. Maybe she really hadn't been a virgin. Yeah, fuckers, fuck you all, Jacob repeated in silence to the men hurling rocks at her. Her father, too, and the compliant women watching behind them. He liked the sound of the profanity in his head. He almost opened his mouth to let it out, loud and strong like his sister. But then, he would have been tied to that tree next, for rebellion. Levi would be looking hard for that kind of thing from him now. There was a sort of pause as the men reloaded their arms with their remaining rocks. Leah's voice slurred into a long, raspy howl as her mouth gaped open, her jaw probably broken now. Levi watched from the porch with folded arms. Jacob stared at his sister, his crude and brave and dying sister, and did not look away. Not from the blood that was trickling out of her nose and gaping mouth. Not from the one eye that was now hooded and bruised. He thought he saw blood coming from there, too. A spinning piece of shale caught her on the cheek, tearing open another gash. A couple of crows rustled and flew out of the pines behind her, spooked by all the noise. Then the dark and jagged hailstorm opened up again. He watched Leah's body jerk and flinch and sag with each impact. Every line and color and detail was vivid and impossibly wrong. He'd seen stonings before but this one he would remember. There was no call for this. He decided with a sudden spurt of silent rebellion, unfamiliar and shocking and strong in his throat, that he would make it right somehow. The howling finally stopped. Leah stared up at the sky through the one open eye, her final act a breaking of the endless rules. Jacob figured the last thing she saw was the sun burning its forbidden image onto her retina until her head slumped forward and hung against her chest, bleeding. Next day was Sabbath. They'd had to work fast to get the body buried before sundown. 
Jacob had held back from the shoveling, his eyes tearing up, even though he didn't want them to. Something lit inside him that wasn't there before. He didn't look at Levi or Caleb or his father. He planned not to speak to any of them again more than necessary. He was none too happy with his friends, who'd also thrown their rocks, but he understood they were just part of it all, like he'd always been. After Levi's sermon, shorter than usual, owing to all the commotion, Jacob walked down to the river with his Bible and saw Emma sitting there, leaning against the cliff. She wasn't far from where he'd knocked out some of the shale. It was hot already, but of course she wore the same dress and long sleeves. He wouldn't be here if any girls were swimming. You all right? Emma asked, squinting up at him. He sat as near as her as respectable. No, not really. Being honest. No shame in it. Your sister and all. How much could he say to her? There'd always be a risk with any frank talk. But they'd been sweet for a year now, and she was always going to be sort of an outsider anyhow. She and her mother had been squatters at Dogpatch, USA, in a pretty good spot, right by the wild water rampage pond with a garden going and everything. The chosen people camped there on the way out of Harrison and wanted some spotters posted on top of the water slide. It was still in one piece. They found Emma's mom in her shed at the bottom, pretty much undressed in the heat. One of the spotters really liked what he saw. The rest of it got kind of ugly, but Levi's dad sorted things out with a Bible passage that said you could take a beautiful woman as a captive and make her your wife. When they finally made it here to the river, after her month of mourning had gone by, the guy had his way with her, and that went about as badly as one would expect, too. But after all that, he wound up letting her go. And it was just Emma and her mom ever since. Gotta say, Jacob finally allowed, it don't sit right with me. Been giving it some thought. And what happened to your mom don't sit right either. She studied his face. Jacob Davis. That really you talking? Something's just not right about it. Your mom getting dragged here and raped neither. The word raped hung awkward in the air. Not forbidden, but not commonly encountered either. Like yesterday's accusing bedsheet slumped on the porch. Jacob looked back at Emma hard and slowly put his Bible down in the grass, as far away as his arm would reach not something he wanted nearby just then. Emma broke the stair and looked around. There was nobody else here yet. That itself was a bit out of line, the two of them being alone like this. I don't like to think about it. It just is. It got you here, at least. She reached across the space between them, and put her hand on his briefly. Glad I got you whatever else happened, she said. You tell me whatever you want, but some things you ought not say generally. I know, I won't. They sat quiet for a while, looking up and down the river and along the ridge for strangers, a habit long established and kept up even with less fighting breaking out nowadays. At this particular moment, they were watching for familiar faces, too. This conversation was on dangerous footing. Emma slid a few inches closer to Jacob, turning toward him. He did not draw back. I didn't like seeing it neither, Jacob. No concern of mine if she'd slept with a man before. And Mama said the sheet don't always tell the story. Jacob wanted desperately to kiss her. She was very close. I wouldn't tell nobody, no matter what the sheet said. I know, she said, a smile flickering along those lips Jacob was studying, then going right out. Listen, you maybe ought to do something. 
This surprised him. Do something? What could he possibly do? He wasn't keen on getting acquainted with those rocks, or around from Levi's remaining stockpile of 223 Remington. Then he heard rustling along the path and stood up fast, continuing to ponder the question as he picked up his Bible and got some proper space between him and Emma. He made for the cabin, nodding to two girls who emerged from the brush where the path opened up. Emma's eyes were still on him every time he looked back. When he got to the cabin, his options for the rest of the Sabbath were to sit on the porch and stare at the pines, go see his friends and do pretty much the same thing with them, talk to his father, or just read his Bible. He sure didn't want to talk to his father right now, or his friends. It was when he got to reading that the idea of what to do made its way into his head. He was thumbing through Deuteronomy, what else, and all of a sudden started trying very hard to remember a sticker he'd seen on the bumper of a rusted-out car in the weed somewhere, probably during a salvage run down to Jasper with his father. The sticker said something about the end of the world and repent now before it's too late. What was memorable about it was that there had been a particular date included. Jacob couldn't remember the date, but it was in the past even when he was checking out the car, and he wondered what the people who put that bumper sticker on there thought after the last day came and went. Maybe they'd already junked the car by then. He'd always looked forward to the end of days, because when it finally came, the chosen people would get their chance to really construct society and get it all brought under Christ's dominion. God's kingdom wouldn't just be in this hill country anymore. Jacob figured that might make all the rules and unpleasant judgments worthwhile. But the thing was that the date had come and gone. Here was the passage he had been thinking of. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. The prophet shall die. Jacob really liked the sound of that. It gave him a strong feeling that was all happy and angry at the same time, to think of Levi tied to that snag where Leah was. He liked the feeling a lot right now. He'd read this verse a bunch of times along with all the rest of it, not paying much attention, but remembering the bumper sticker is what made him think of it now, along with the next part, And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? It was a question, and a pretty good one, he thought. How'd you know if God said it, when you only hear it from somebody who clearly ain't God? Jacob wasn't much for coming up with questions, or even daring to ask the ones that presented plain as day. And then the Bible answered its own question, right there in the next verse. Jacob gave the text some considerable study, reading it over and over again. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. If the thing follow not, nor come to pass. He looked up and smiled and finally noticed that it was getting dark. Sabbath was over. He didn't have to just sit here and read anymore. But he stayed on the bed and thought and thought. He really wanted to not be afraid of the prophet anymore, as much as he wanted to see him tied up to that tree. Congregational lunch at the Ridge House was usually something Jacob looked forward to. It was a chance to eat well despite the lean times and hear the latest news about God's curses on the world outside the hill country. In between all the prayers and Bible and serious talk, there'd be swapping of everyday stories and even some laughs. 
Plus, they were letting him sit by Emma now, as their courting was well established, and this was about the safest place around for them to be near each other. But Jacob Davis was no longer the wide-eyed kid he'd been all the other times here. He was disgusted at the way he'd sat in awe of Levi and Caleb, wondering if he might someday get called into the inner circle. He was ashamed at how hard he'd worked at doing all the right things and letting all the right people see it. Kissing ass is how Leah would have put it, with the former Jacob shaking his head and telling her not to talk that way. Well, the only ass-kissing he was going to do now was what it took to stay alive and carry out his plan. Levi made his grand appearance and did his prayer and sat himself down at the head of the long table in the main room. After an amen and respectable silence, everybody else pulled out their chairs and sat down too. It was the inner circle guys at the main table plus the rotation of a few everyday members there, with everybody else at tables on the deck and in the other rooms. For an Ozark vacation house, it did serve its modified purpose pretty well. Jacob wasn't particularly surprised that he'd been invited to the big table this time. It gave Levi a way to make an appeasement gesture and also probe him for signs of rebellion. Jacob's father, who'd been stupidly happy about the invitation, but otherwise allowed Jacob his silence after the stoning, sat across the table from him. Emma was, of course, seated next to Jacob, with one of the respectable ladies on her other side to make woman talk, while the menfolk pondered deeper matters. Emma's mother never came to the lunches, and nobody pressed her on it. The Harding servants brought the food out from the kitchen, Hominy, cooked greens with eggs, venison, and pork chops. Jacob took one of the chops as the plate made its way down to him and remembered yet another heated discussion at Levi's house in Harrison. He knew his Bible, even back then, and followed most of what was said. Some of the men said Jesus overrode Deuteronomy when it came to what you could eat. The others reminded everybody what the Biblical Blueprint series said about the Old and New Testaments. One guy kept quoting the line Jacob knew all too well, God's counsel and judgments are not divided. That old coot probably couldn't even taste bacon anymore. Somebody else wondered if Deuteronomy really needed to be taken whole hog when it came to the rules even Jesus said weren't important. Then Levi's dad recalled that the guy who edited Biblical Blueprint figured the food laws didn't apply, and that was the view that finally won out. Truth be told, the whole thing might have come down to hunger more than doctrine. There'd been a lot of hogs left rooting around when they got done burying the bodies. Jacob chewed on his pork chop. They'd need to find some more salt soon. He thought about the way everybody held real strong to the Old Testament at this table, except when it came to the things they liked being able to eat. He hoped they wouldn't make that kind of an exception when it came to what he was planning. The clanking of dishes and silverware died down, and Levi made a comment about being thankful for the food God had given. Amen along with his usual rant about the ungodly starving masses getting what was coming to them, sweating it out and dying down in the cities. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, he recited. Amen, everybody answered, at all the tables, inside and out on the deck. Amen, Jacob agreed, loud enough for Levi to notice. He did, and smiled down the table from his big chair. William Duncan leaned forward, looked left and right, and then at Levi. We sure got no one to the curses of the Almighty down there, sir, he said. A veteran ass-kisser, this good old boy was. Inner circle, tight with Levi's dad back in the day. Didn't seem to bother him how young the new prophet in that chair was. It was sir this and sir that from the get-go. 
Levi twisted to face Duncan and leaned sideways onto an elbow, padded armrest holding his weight, hands folded. What y'all seen, Bill? We had to go all the ways to Harrison, last holin' up run. Sir, it's bad. Real bad. Slathers, skeletons everywhere. More dead than alive nowadays. Folks have taken to eating whatever they can find, and it ain't much. No, sir, I reckon the women eating their afterbirth ain't long in coming. So it's finally come to that. Yes, sir, it has. Even hotter in here, of course, and humid as all get out besides. Death hanging in the air. Sickness and hunger. Was real glad to see the camp of the saints again, let me tell you, sir. Duncan speared another chunk of venison from a plate nearby. Jacob could not recall him ever eating the pork, come to think of it. Afterbirth, Levi said, shaking his head. Not right seen that particular thing yet, sir. I was just saying. No, no, I get it, Bill. Levi unclasped his hands and interrupted Duncan with a little sideways wave. It's okay, you just got me thinking there. The table waited through a pause, and Duncan chewed his venison, and then Levi added, Birth pangs, beginning of sorrows, the great tribulation. May we soon see it. We join John in saying, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. As those present said amen, Jacob felt a tap on his foot and turned to Emma. She was looking at him very serious, and she mouthed the word, Now. Now? She'd been the one counseling patience when they went over his plan the other night. He was pleased at how much she'd liked it, and didn't mind much at all when she added ideas that he had to admit, were pretty good. But this could take weeks, maybe months, she'd warned. Gotta get this right. There won't be a second chance. He kept looking at her. Now, her mouth went again. It made sense, he supposed, with the end times talk going on right then, though that was fairly common at this table. He wondered what made Emma so sure that the moment was right. This was a big step. He didn't feel ready. Maybe he never would. He kept looking at her. She nodded just a little at him. It was time, she was telling him. Now. Jacob stirred up everything inside himself and sat up straighter and looked down the table at Levi and heard his voice stick itself deep into the silence. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. He could fetch up some revelation when the occasion rose, he could. Not bad at all. Praise the Lord, he said, extending an open hand toward Levi for blessing us with a prophet to render his righteous judgments and tell us the signs of the times. It wasn't exactly speaking out of turn, sounding off like that with a Bible quote and all right after Levi, but it sure wasn't expected. There was a surprised little amen from those at the big table. The others held off. Levi took in Jacob's eyes and said, Glad to hear you say it, Jacob, friend and brother. I feel moved to do so, sir, Jacob held out both hands over the table. The Lord has preserved us through his chosen prophets in perilous times. He opened his hands wider, palms upward. There was spirit to be caught here, supplication. He had to make this look good. Just one chance. Then Emma said, Amen. Alone, with the others joining in after a moment, weak and hesitant. Levi looked over at her, then back at Jacob. Was that a smirk on his face? 
or just a pleased smile bestowed upon members of his loyal flock. Too late to back out now. Jacob got to his feet, arms going wide, one hand grabbing Emma's. Emma took his hand firm and reached her other one over to the woman whose garden she'd been discussing. The woman had been a Pentecostal before gathering with the Chosen, and that was a lucky break. When Emma got up, the woman did too, right away. There was praying and swaying to be done. Across the table, Jacob's father got hold of the spirit and beamed. His son had finally seen the wisdom of God's ways, far above our own. Hallelujah! He stood too. Levi looked up at everybody standing around him, even Bill Duncan half out of his chair. It would not look good for the prophet to be the only one still seated at such a moment. He grabbed Duncan's hand and Caleb's on his other side and stood. Jacob listened to the creaking and rustling of everybody standing now. Outside on the deck, he saw silhouettes hand in hand against the sunlit trees. Praise the Lord Almighty, he said, for the wisdom of his prophet in this blessed land of hills. Praise him. Unto him and the prophet be praise. Amen. He got a nice strong amen this time. It must have seemed official enough now. Levi, after all, was standing and holding hands in the chain, too. Jacob winced at having just called for all that praise unto the prophet along with God himself. Not exactly biblical, but it'd probably be okay. Lord, we seek guidance from your holy prophet, he said, looking upwards. The view to heaven was blocked by the varnished wood of Levi's vaulted ceiling. Others started looking up as well. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, says your holy word, but not here, Lord, not here. Levi's black eyebrows furrowed at Jacob, who continued his frantic petition to the ceiling. We see the tribulation of these days. Past the hills are famines and pestilences, great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He'd read Matthew 24 a few times yesterday, expecting he might need it. And now, he said, moving his eyes slowly down, sliding them over to Levi, we ask, Lord, to know the day when Jesus returns, the very day. Ye know not. What hour your Lord doth come, Levi said. He knew his Matthew too. Lord, enlighten your prophet as to the day and the hour, Jacob asked the ceiling, that we might prepare ourselves. Then he shook and flailed, struck hard by the Spirit. He began swaying, and Emma backed him up with her own powerful burst of spirit, and then the once Pentecostal lady did some swaying of her own. Jacob's father had tears streaming down his face, and his hands that had also thrown the rocks started pulling left and right on the chain of hands from his side of the table, too. There was pulling from both sides of the table, and much praise directed upwards, not just from Jacob and Emma anymore. And finally, all of it got Levi moving as well. Jacob let it go on for a few moments and then shook his hands free. He kicked his chair out of the way and let himself collapse into a broken heap beside the table, wailing as loud as he could manage. The day and the hour, he cried. The day and the hour, Lord, Emma joined in, and it did not take more than once or twice more. And then everybody except Levi was shouting in full-throated gospel cadence, The day and the hour, Lord, the day and the hour. And then it stopped. And all was silent except for Jacob sobbing, authentic now in terror at what he'd made himself do. The day and the hour... Determined by Levi during a prophetic moment following the outburst at the Ridge House, took a good fifteen months to arrive. Jacob and Emma had about died with suspense, wondering if he'd follow through. 
but the combination of expectation and ego, stirred up with some powerful spirit, proved irresistible. When everybody had sat back down and Jacob got himself pulled back together, Levi closed his eyes and held up his arms for some long minutes and then informed his flock precisely when the end of days would occur. Jacob found two occasions to repeat the date out loud before everybody finally got up from the long table. He wanted the day, if not the hour, carefully noted by all present. And then he drove straight into helping his beloved prophet, friend, and brother prepare for the imminent end. It was a hard slog, but Jacob's hide and happiness depended on him kissing Levi's prophetic ass longer and more convincingly than he ever could have imagined. In the darkest hours of the nights following all the stressful days of holding up stores and praying, he found an outlet for the stress in Emma. He was unable to propose marriage, considering the times and Paul's example but the two of them experienced a surprising lack of guilt about following through with the consummation nonetheless. On some old quilts, Emma stashed a safe distance down the river. Then the day and the hour came and went. Neither he nor Emma was greatly surprised, but Jacob actor and survivor, went full-on apocalyptic about it, bewailing their continued presence with no Jesus in sight. He walked from house to cabin to shack, banging on doors and yelling about false prophecy to the occupants while jabbing an accusing finger at his hand-printed calendar. All the days after the prophesied one he dramatically marked out in black, and yet there they stood. Jacob and whichever puzzled members of the Chosen he was talking to, looking at the blacked-out date right in front of them. They heard no trumpets, just insects in the tall grass that kept right on growing. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Jacob turned the Lord's words over in his mind, savoring them keeping a piece of them for himself. It ain't just yours, Lord, he thought, watching Levi's head sag against his bloodied chest, picking up one last rock from the porch, feeling the heft and sharp edges of it in his hand. Before he raised his arm to throw... And that, my friends, is Ed Swominen's The Stones of Tribulation. And I have links to the written version with all the footnotes and sourcing from the book of Deuteronomy and all that information in the description box of this broadcast. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you back here in one week as we talk about god-awful movies. That's coming up next Tuesday night on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com